Florida Medical Association, helping physicians practice medicine. Welcome to the Medicine Curated Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Stapleton, CEO of the Florida Medical Association. Uh, Today, our guest is Dr. Christy Alexander. Uh, Dr. Alexander is the immediate past president of the Florida Academy of Family uh, Physicians. She's the current board chair of the Florida Academy of Family Physicians, and she's a member of the Board of Governors of the Florida Medical Association. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Alexander. Thank you for having me. This is really exciting. Well, great. Uh, We're happy to have you. Um, You know, let's start by um, having you tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, where did you grow up? Uh, Where did you go to school? What made you decide to uh, pursue a career in medicine and ultimately a career in family medicine? Sure. So I grew up in Orlando, Florida. Uh, I was actually born in Gainesville, Shands. So I am a Florida cracker, as they say. I have sure. only lived outside of the state for a few years while my parents were in cooking school, uh, which is another story because I don't come from a medical family at all. I'm the only doctor in the family. We could do a whole <laughs> podcast on cooking. That would be great. <laughs> I know, right? Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, they're culinary trained chefs. They can do it. That's for sure. Wow. But yeah, pretty, pretty cool upbringing in the food world. Not not medical. (laughs) (laughs) So um, the story goes that my um, mom, I was watching Sesame Street when I was like three, and there was a doctor helping their patients. And I was asking my mom what they were doing. And that's what she told me. And she and I said, well, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And the rest is history. Of course, my mom was like, you know, I'm sure that was what was going through her mind, but. So you got a lot of encouragement. A lot of encouragement. Yeah. Starting with Sesame Street. So pretty hilarious. Um, but yeah, so through the years, I mean, I, I thought about becoming a veterinarian, but it was always about taking care of something, making that something better. Um, I shadowed a vet for a while and and I was like, I, I, I can't do this to animals. Is it terrible <laughs> that I can do it to people? I don't know. Um, but. Uh, it just, it, I couldn't do it. It was too heartbreaking seeing my pets die, even though they weren't my pets, you know. Um, so as time went on, you know, I, I, I went to Winter Park High School, which is outside of Orlando. It's in Winter Park, Florida. But I was commuted there because I was in the IB program. So I was in the IB program, got shipped out to Winter Park every day, graduated from there. And during that time, I was in the medical explorers of Florida Hospital. And I became their vice president and then their president, as you can imagine (laughs) from knowing me. Um, And it was through those experiences shadowing docs in Orlando that I realized that that was really what I I was going to do. Even though the seed had been planted, it was Mm -hmm. for real. It became my own at that point. Yeah. So that's kind of how it all started. Um, As far as family medicine goes, I actually wanted to be a pediatrician for a really long time because of my pediatricians growing up because they were so phenomenal. And one of them is still in Orlando now, Dr. Robert Quigley. So it's kind of cool. Like when I was, um, interesting story, when I was uh, interviewing for residencies, one of the residencies was in Orlando and he was on faculty there. So it was really wild to be interviewed by your pediatrician for residency. (laughs) But it was also very, very cool. Yeah, so the family medicine for me, it was um, in med school. I came in saying family medicine because I worked for patients first and Dr. Thomas Hicks. You guys probably know Dr. Hicks. Of course. He work in organized medicine, and he really got the organized medicine bug planted. Um, and seeing everything he was doing politically, how active he was, what an incredible physician he was, how he served his patients. I came into medical school saying family medicine, and it just went from there. Yeah. And so you were in the inaugural class at um, Florida State University's College of Medicine, and you're actually the first graduate. I read this. uh, You're the first graduate to return as a full time faculty member. So tell us about that journey um, and what attracted you to to come back to FSU and and uh, and pursue um, medical education. Sure. Yeah, that's a that's another great story. I mean, being in the first class, first of all, even back up a little bit more, I applied to medical school the year prior and didn't get in. So it's even 
cooler. I mean, it was not cool at the time. I was devastated. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, you fast forward a little bit and um, I just, you know, I applied again. I was determined. I knew I wanted to go to med school, got a lot of good support, a lot of good recommendations in regards to what to do, what I needed to do to improve my application, all of that. Applied again, not knowing I was applying to FSU's first medical school. I thought I was applying to the PIMS program. Mm. And, you know, applied, went through the whole process, got accepted in January of 2001. And shortly thereafter, I got a message saying, yeah, this is no longer PIMS. You're going to be in the first class of the FSU College of Medicine. So very exciting. Had no idea what that meant, because, of course, the journey with that, as you know, was very tumultuous in regards to getting accredited and all of the phases with that, um, working with. President Thrasher at the time, who was, you know, in our Senate and not mm -hmm. the president of MSU, um, and Darrell Peden, and, or in the House, yeah, and um, then Darrell Peden. I mean, just working with those two guys and watching that process and getting us approved as Sandy Dylenberg. I mean, it was a wild, wild, wild time to say the very, very least. And because we were only 30 medical students, we were so close. You know, I mean, we were just the closest knit class. Yeah. I can imagine. It was like it was like going through it with your family. So every time we didn't get accredited, we were all just crushed together. You know, we all went through it together. And I think that process, even now, being in touch with all the people that went through it with us, Dr. Hurt, Dr. Livingston, you know, I went to Sandy Dallenberg's funeral. I mean, you, you're just part of that family. When the opportunity came to be on faculty full time, it was like, it was like almost like a dream come true. Like, really? Wow. I get to come back and pay it forward. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Just really, really awesome to have had that opportunity. So with your last name being Alexander, uh, did they, when you, when you graduated, you were the first class, are you the first person to actually walk across the stage? As a as a graduate of FSU's college, no, of because I was married at the time and my last name was Sane. But let me tell you, a number of times I've had that thought. No, man. Well, I was gonna I was gonna tell you an interesting story. We had another uh, former FMA uh, leader, uh, Dr. Carl Altenberger, who was in the first class at University of South Florida's College of Medicine, and he actually, because his last name's Altenberger, he was the first one. To uh, to walk across the stage, I thought that would be an interesting parallel. But uh, anyways, that'd be incredible. So you you spent some time, yeah. So you spent some time in private practice before you know coming back to FSU, and you served. As you mentioned you served as a medical director at Patients First um, in Tallahassee. Um, how is that experience um, as a private practice physician? Uh, how does that help shape your views as a teacher and mentor now uh, to medical students? I love that. Um, a little bit more history on the teaching bit. I was chief resident at the Tallahassee Memorial Family Medicine Residency Program. So because you're chief, you do a lot of teaching. And I really didn't. The reason to become chief wasn't so much the teaching for me, because that was very intimidating to think I was going to teach my peers. It was more about the leadership and I think I can help, you know, figure things out when things are broken and stuff like that. So it was very interesting to, to start teaching that early on. Um, when I graduated, they asked if I could take a day of my private practice to come teach at the College of Medicine. So I was actually at the Patients First on Raymond Deal Road four days a week. And then I was teaching one day a week um, at the College of Medicine already. And we were teaching, uh, I would take students in to precept them while I was practicing. So I had students kind of following me around the office a couple times a year, plus going in and teaching at the College of Medicine. So I was kind of, I never really broke the chain of teaching from residency onward. But I think it's so important because when students see you in your office, in practice, watching what you do, watching those connections with your patients, it's kind of like, it's one thing to tell somebody what to do. It's another thing to show them how to do it. That's just really, really amazing. When I came into the College of Medicine, I've been, they had us doing part-time practice. So I've never stopped practicing as a full-time educator. 
I've just done it in different places. So I was in Perry for a little while, and now we're at our FSU Primary Health Center, um, and I'm there a couple of days a week. And so we will still have students coming through. So what's really cool about that is when you're standing in front of a class and you're telling them about a certain condition or a certain way to treat a particular patient, a particular thing, I can always refer back, oh, by the way, the patient I saw last week and their eyes are like, oh, now it's real. So it's not, you know, I mean, it really puts it in perspective for them. I think I, what I've seen is they appreciate it so much when you have that personal story that you can relate back to somebody you actually saw. It's not just textbook. It's real. Yeah. So it's been a really, again, with the journey, it's been hodgepodge thrown together and then it becomes what it is. But yeah. it's so great to be able to do it in every aspect of what I've done from the, the day go, you know, from the very beginning. Well, you know, talking about your journey, your journey this past year has led you to become um, a regular commentator on television. You're on the local news in Tallahassee. Um, you know, during the pandemic, you've been a commentator providing public health information and medical insights to the public. Um, so tell us a little bit about how that experience, um, tell us about that experience and how that uh, uh, you're showing, you know, value the value that physicians bring to the to the table um, in a pandemic. I think I think we kind of uh, the public takes for granted that uh, well you know doctors do this and that, but actually being on television in a time where people are really focused on uh, what's going on uh, and want to know the latest information about the pandemic. How is how has that experience been for you? It's been really incredible. Um, it's nothing again not expected. Um, I became the president of the Florida Academy of Family Physician December 2019, and about a week later, um, there was an email that came to the school asking whoever was available to come do a spot on vaping, and that's how it started. So I was the one that was available, went in, did the spot. A couple months or a month later, maybe they wanted something on the flu, and I couldn't do it, so I sent, I asked one of my colleagues, and they did it, and then fast forward a couple weeks later and it was COVID. It was the very first spot. And actually I was live in studio that time because at that point we weren't even, the masks weren't even a thing. It's very interesting to look back at it now. And um, the producer that day, as I left the set, he was like, wow, you're really good at this. Have you done this before? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> he said, can you come back? Would you, he kind of jokingly said, we should make this a weekly thing. And I was like, yeah, that would be great. Kind of like one of those. Yeah, right. It's not going to happen. And then the next week he texted and said, I know we're in that. At that point, we were all remote. We were all masked up, staying home, quarantine and started to kick in and asked if I could do it remotely. And the rest is kind of history. But I will say, at, while it's flattering and all of that, it's more for me that it's about sending a clear message to the public about what's really going on. And yeah. reassuring the public because there's so much misinformation out there. So it's this balance of not scaring people, keeping it real, basing it on the science and providing as much good information as I can so that people feel better. You yeah. know, yeah. this has been a scary time. And I think I don't think that I knew that that was my mission or whatever going into it. But the feedback has been that that, I, you know, there's a way of saying things that is real, truthful, not scary, like, oh my gosh, we're all going to die, but real people are dying. And this is what you do to prevent it. You know, just that message of clarity, I think. Yeah. And you know, there, there's been um, recently a, uh, a lot of talk about how there's been an increase in interest among young people going into medicine. We're seeing more um, medical school applicants this year, there's been a spike. They call it the Fauci effect. I've, I've heard it called that. And, um, you know, so that may be one of the you know, positive things about the pandemic has been that, you know, people get to see physicians um, on a regular basis. And I think, you know, the, the fact that you're going on television, reassuring the public, um, you may inspire uh, that next, you know, little girl, instead of watching Sesame Street and saying, what are they doing? They may see you, see you and say, I want to do what she's doing. And I think that's, if there's anything, you know, positive that can be taken from the pandemic, it's the fact that physicians have been put uh, 
you know, front in the front uh, lines and uh, people, I think, see uh, the sacrifices and the heroic efforts of doctors. And I think that uh, hopefully will be one of the um, one of the good things that comes out of this is people have a renewed uh, respect for physicians. So um, and kudos to you for for going out and um, and and doing that because it's not easy. It's not easy to go on television and talk and really talk about uh, you know complicated issues that are that are changing in real time and being able to to do that and and give the public reassure the public as you said. I think is really important. It's been tough. That's been a tough balance. I mean, you know, I, I try to think about what I'm going to say before I'm going on. And then sometimes you just say it and it kind of, I'm like, I, I, you know, people that I'll say, well, did I say everything? Okay. And they're like, yeah, you did fine. <laughs> Cause you don't even hear yourself sometimes, but I will say one of the cool things that's come out of this is tomorrow. We're actually going to be doing, um, a Facebook live with WCTV with all of us getting our shots on air. So, you know, just stuff like that, having that connection and being able to say, no, it's safe. See, I'm getting it, too. And having Dr. Van Dermy, like all of our family docs, Dr. Brownspace, Dr. Helgren, all these people have been, you know, really instrumental in fighting this on the front lines and here in Tallahassee anyway, being yeah. able to see all these people getting their immunizations on the air you know, semi live, they were going to do a live segment, but they don't have any live segments tomorrow. So they're going to take some news bits and put that on the news too. But just, it's really, really amazing, you know, what you can do to reach the public that way. In addition to taking care of our patients and making sure we're doing a good job that way. That's part of it too, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's great. I think, you know, we're, we're now, um, at, at a point where you know the public awareness about the vaccine has increased, and and hopefully, um, you know the the uh, messages from you and other physicians that it's safe, and they see you doing it, um, uh, getting your shot. Hopefully, that reassures the public, and we can get everybody vaccinated. I know that there's, uh, you know, there are people out there that are that are hesitant, and um, it's more important than ever for physicians to show you know leadership in that regard. So you've been, um, as we mentioned, you you were the president of the uh, Florida Academy of Family Physicians during this past year, pretty tumultuous year to say the least. But um, what are the issues going forward that uh, family medicine um, that are important to family medicine? In you know, as as we as we move beyond the pandemic. Well, scope of practice will always be very important. Yeah. Um, reimbursement and parity is always important, of course. And now, you know, we're getting into that telemedicine because of the pandemic. Telemedicine has become front and center and reimbursement for that across all specialties, but certainly family medicine as well. Um, kind of looking at that big picture of where do we stand with the hospital associations and with the big players? You know, what is our role in those venues, there's a lot of people going into direct primary care now for that autonomy piece, you know, breaking away from the ownership of a hospital or from an organization. Um, and I think we're going to see that moving forward, less the private doctor hanging their shingle. The new version of that is DPC. Yeah, and I think we're going to see a lot of that and the support around that is going to be huge and already has been really, really big. Um, in past legislation before COVID that, you know, yeah. that was on the docket. So just thinking about these issues moving forward and, and um, making sure that we as family physicians are still the captain of the team in mm -hmm. regards to our role. And there's an understanding of the differences when we talk about scope of practice um, yeah. across all specialties, but definitely, definitely family medicine. Let, 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 let's get into that a little bit more because during the past year, of course, we dealt with several scope of practice battles in the, in the legislature and the FMA along with um, uh, FAFP um, has consistently opposed uh, the movement towards independent practice and relaxing uh, supervision requirements for nurses and PAs. Tell us why allowing non-physicians to practice independently is so dangerous to, the, to, to patients and why physician-led care um, is, is really in the best interest of patients. Absolutely. And that goes for, I said family medicine, but that's your general internists, that's pediatricians, 
Um, it's all of us in primary care, not just family medicine. So to be clear on that, um, and certainly the physician led team is, is paramount to all of it. Um, yeah, so you think about the training and some of the arguments of, well, they've had 2,000 or 5,000 hours of training. It's plenty, right, to go out and you know take care of people without supervision. And when you look at just the numbers themselves and you say, okay, well, your family doc, your pediatrician, your general internist has 30,000 hours and sometimes mm -hmm. more than that in training. So now who would you like to see, you know, as your physician or as your provider? We, we're getting away from even using the word provider now so that people understand physician is yeah. physician and changing the nomenclature around that. So, you know who you're seeing because, I mean, everybody's called a doctor. It's very um, difficult these days to know who you're seeing. And it, it's kind of scary for folks that I mean, I can imagine my mom going to a doctor and not asking that question and just not knowing. It's not that yeah. she's not a bright person or my dad, that they're bright, not bright people. They just would take for granted that that means physician. And so I think there's a lot we need to do around that to educate the public so that they know what they're getting. Let them make some decisions. It doesn't have to be all us. Let them let the let them do the walking, let their fingers do the talking, so to speak. Um, you know, all of us together have to make it happen. It's got to be not just the physicians, not just the FMA, not just the FAP, but the patients, everybody around us needs to be having that conversation. Yeah, I think people do take for granted when they go into a, a clinic, uh, whether it's a retail clinic or uh, uh, some other uh, clinic, they, they, they see people with white coats and they assume that they're seeing a physician and that's not always the case. And I think that's one of the uh, with this new law passing that will allow for independent practice, I think it's uh, it's going to be more important that we educate the public to so that they know to ask those questions uh, and know the credentials of the of the person that's uh, taking care of you that that or that you're entrusting to take care of a member of your family. And so um, that'll be a challenge going forward, uh, certainly. And I think it's something that uh, the FMA as well as all the specialties can work together on. So, you know, I want to, you, you touched on this a little bit about the evolution of, of family medicine and uh, new technologies. You know, we have now um, virtual care and telemedicine really, they were always there, but they really have, have taken off since uh, the pandemic. And then we've seen a growth in uh, retail health clinics and then other models of, of delivery. You mentioned direct primary care, and there's also concierge care. So it seems like for uh, a someone that wants to go into family medicine, a, a medical student or uh, or a resident who's trying to decide, OK, you know, do I want to be employed or what do I want to do? There's so many options and opportunities and choices, really, uh, for a career in, in primary care um, and, and probably more than ever before. Do you, do you agree with that? I completely agree with that. I think that's what makes it so exciting, actually, is the ability to do so many different things. I think people got scared that we were all going to become into this, this model of always being under a big group or under a hospital system. And that's what it's going to become. And it's just not so. I mean, there's so many different platforms for what we do. It's, in, it's just absolutely incredible. As, as much as your mind will let it happen, it can be created, so to speak. So um, I think that's where concierge came from and, and direct primary care came from was seeing a different model, a way to do things differently and just doing it, going for it and, and making that work. Um, so, yeah, thinking about our residents and our medical students, again, it's as much as they see. So if they see us in action, they see what we're doing. That's part of it. They understand that what we do is different because there is that conversation. Well, how are you any different than a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant at this point? There has been that conversation. So, it, you know, I mentioned the hours of training earlier, but I think they see it when they're around us. There's a limit. There's a stop. OK, well, we're going to refer you now or oh, this is this is as much as I know at this point. I don't know what the next step would be. So I'll send you to that next person. Whereas we, we know how to do it. We just do it, you know, and it's them being able to see that in action. Um, also, you know, the breadth, the scope, we have to maintain our scope of practice. I think, you know, we talk about scope in so many different ways. Scope in one way is people encringing on it. Scope in another way is maintaining what we were trained to do. 
I mean, we can deliver babies. We can do, there's so many things we can do. And that's not infringing on the scope of practice of an OBGYN. That's just offering a service that we're trained to do, especially in certain communities that may not have access. So when we talk about that access issue, let us practice to our full scope. So that's a whole nother conversation about just family medicine in general. That one's more, maybe more specific to family med. Um, but in that way too, I may have heard residents say, that's what we, that's what our medical students and our residents want to see is that whatever we're being trained to do, we can keep doing it. It's not yeah. going to, that still won't be taken away from us as we move forward because family docs love procedures. They love doing stuff with their hands and they love talking to the patient and having that relationship and handling the diabetes and the 50 other things that, you know, come with the patient when they present to you. So it's the complexity that we love. It's the, we want to take the care of the, the patient the second they're born all the way until the end of their lives. Um, both all genders, all comers, all of it. Um, and if, if you like that as a student, then you're going to love family medicine. We just need to make sure we don't take any of that away through policy and procedure. There really, it really is a great time uh, for primary care. And, you know, we could talk even more about, uh, you know, nutrition and the importance of educating people on, on healthy living. And certainly we've seen with COVID, um, you know, people that, that have, uh, uh, that might be overweight or, or have other um, uh, conditions that, uh, you know, they, they seem to be the ones that have gotten sickest. Um, and so, you know, there's an opportunity there as a primary care physician to really be a partner uh, for your patients. And, and uh, so I, I, I just, um, I'm real excited, frankly, about the opportunities out there for primary care. And hopefully with some of the policy changes that are occurring at the federal level uh, around reimbursement, we'll see more, um, uh, more young people decide to go into primary care. I think that would be great. So let's talk a little bit about the relationship. Do you want to, you want to, do you have anything more to say about that? I was just going to say that Fauci effect, you're talking about people going into it is very real. So speaking of yeah. policy, we need more residency spots, man. We need to, like, yep. you know, we need more, yep. we want to create that um, more family docs, more primary care physicians, whatever, whether it's yeah. whichever the primary care specialty. Yeah, man, yeah. let's, that's part of it for sure. And one of the things we heard, you know, from, uh, as we were dealing with these scope of practice battles with the nurses and PAs, you hear um, the argument that, well, there's a shortage of physicians, so we have to, you know, fill that gap with with other, uh, what I would say, less qualified individuals. Well, hopefully now we can say, no, we don't, people shouldn't have to settle for less, uh, a less qualified person taking care of them. You know, we have the capabilities, um, uh, and technology too has helped, uh, extend those capabilities. Um, so, um, so anyways, well, let, let's talk a little bit about the relationship, you know, between uh, the Florida Academy of Family Physicians and the FMA. You're in a unique position because you uh, have been in leadership positions. Uh, you're in a leadership position with both organizations. You're immediate past president of FAFP and you're on the board of the FMA. So you've seen, you know, firsthand, uh, how important it is to to collaborate and work together and the benefits of doing that. You know, I was talking with someone earlier uh, about, um, well, they're, they've been involved in their specialty society and only recently have they seen that, wow, you know, the FMA does all these things and it's important to be part of both organizations. Um, can you share your thoughts about the, the collaboration that exists between specialty societies and the FMA and how important it is for physicians to have that unity. Absolutely. I remember I first got involved with the FAFP because it just made sense since I was in family medicine. They kind of steer you that way and you have to make some choices about, you know, who, who, do, I, who do I belong to and all of that. But then I can't remember when it was exactly. I remember somebody using the, the, the phrase, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I've just always love that phrase. And, and I learned that just from being around, you know, Dr. Hicks and different people like we talked about through our, the previous questions and seeing what a difference they could make um, 
in organized medicine on a whole, and they are different. They're different. If you're in your specialty society, it's very, very important because they're going after your specific needs. They're going to be supporting those needs as they affect you, as for my case, family physician. Um, but it's equally important to be involved in the state medical associations because of the fact that they're looking out for all physicians and may, but the, the, the great part about being both collaborating is they have different pull. So family physicians might have a certain, you know, seat at the table again, to use that analogy. And FMA has a certain seat at the table to use that analogy and coming together, the force is greater. You have two seats instead of just one, so to speak, yeah. if you want to continue the analogy. So, I mean, you know, it's about, it's about that. It's about supporting our physicians and, 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 and through that, it's supporting our patients of Florida. It's taking care of the best care for the patients of Florida. And as much as we can collaborate to do that, we're all on the same page. We all just want to practice good medicine, take care of people, do a good job um, and do it well and not have the certain things taken away from us, not have things that we need taken away from us. And to, in addition, to go get those things that we need, whatever they may be. You know, like I said, concierge medicine and DPC is kind of is booming now because of some of that legislation that we went after earlier on and all of us working together. It's the only way to do it. It's the only way to do it. To, to have one group saying, oh, we can do it on our own. It's just like anything. It doesn't work. If we can all get together and be at that same table, man, the power is huge, huge. Well, I have to give a shout out to um, my colleague, the CEO of the, the Florida Academy of Family Physicians, Jay Milson. You know, he works really closely with our team and our staff. And your the lobbying team that that uh, uh, Jim Doughton and Amy uh, Diaz Lyon, um, who who are the lobbyists for FAFP, they work you know hand you know hand to hand with uh, with the FMA's team, and it really is a family. Um, and you know that it's so important, um, as you said, you know the specialty societies can can focus you know specifically on issues that impact. Um, uh, their members, but being part of the FMA raises the 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 level of those issues. Having people like yourself uh, in primary care on the FMA board, it's important that we have that perspective. I think you know years ago the FMA, um, and, and this wasn't a fair uh, view, but you know you you would hear from physicians that say, well, the FMA only you know cares about specialists. Uh, you know their their leadership is dominated by you know, surgeons or, or whatever. And, um, you know, it's important that, that those, um, that we confront those, those myths, because they really are myths, that the FMA has always been there for everyone. But now that we have uh, more diverse leadership, uh, we have, we've, we've made a point of, you know, reaching out to primary care to make sure that we have representation, whether it's on our board or councils and committees, because it's really important as the FMA being the umbrella organization that we that we get the perspective of all of all physicians, and you've helped provide that and uh, and others as well. Um, we have a number of primary care physicians now on the on the FMA board, and so um, it really leads to I think a, a really healthy and balanced uh, discussion, and um, it helps us do a better job of fulfilling our mission of helping physicians practice medicine. So. Um, and we've kind of touched on these themes, but kind of uh, uh, what's your your sort of closing message to your colleagues who, um, you know, are maybe wondering whether they should be involved in organized medicine or even be a member? What's your message to those people about the importance of being a member of both the FAFP as well as the FMA? I think it's so important. Um, it's so funny that you mentioned that about the the way people saw the FMA before as being, you know, you know, all these specialty driven sort of association. And as you were talking, I remembered Terry McCoy, yeah. you know, thinking, wait a minute, what about Terry, you know? And, That's right. and I've just been so fortunate to have been around all these big players. You know, Tony McCoy started our medical school with us, her, his wife. So mm -hmm. I, so I got to know them and I, and it's through just, you just have to watch and see that, it's not all or nothing. Nothing ever is. If you if you see if somebody's saying that, you have to be there to see that that's not true. 
And yep. so I think that was part of it is just slowly like meeting all of you guys, meeting everybody on the board, meeting all the fantastic physicians that are really helping to run the FMA and, and hearing their voices and seeing, wow, we're, we're not that different. You know, I mean, here it was laid out as, oh, they don't think like we think, you know, you're, they're different, they're, they, you know, and just not, I, and I would come back and say, but I'm not seeing that. Tell me where that is. You know, yeah, everybody's going to have a difference of opinion. We're not all going to think like family docs. That's just not going to happen. That's why it's an association of everybody. Um, and I think that's what it is. That's the message I kind of when when somebody's asking me about the FMA and, and what they how how it is being on the board, say it's just like anything else. I mean, we're all we all have a voice. We're all heard, and everything that's said is taken into account. So when something moves forward, it's not after much much discussion and voted upon. And just like anything democratically that's how things end up moving forward. So if you're not there to participate in that, I, I can represent you because I am the representative for District A, sure, let me know how you feel about that and I will send your voice along. Um, but being a part of the organization as well is part of that process. And so I think a lot of times when they see it, they're like, oh, okay, I see now. And I think once they get involved, like really get involved, it's one thing just to sit back and kind of watch it, but you also have to be on the committee or stand up when a resolution is being, you know, discussed on the floor. Um, get involved and then you're involved. So I think that's been my message to most people is like, come to a meeting, come to the annual meeting, be a delegate, watch the process, stand up and testify. So that you feel what that feels like, but don't do it just to do it. If you feel strongly about something, please stand up, let your voice be heard. And I think that's when people, it, it, it starts to, okay, now I see how this works, you know, because, you know, at most state specialty societies, you're not standing up and talking about resolutions and there isn't a house of delegates for the FAFP. We talk about a lot of things and we have a lot of legislation, but it's not the same process. So Lot to be said about coming in and seeing it for yourself before casting dispersions. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think focusing on what, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you're all physicians. And so um, uh, while there may be an emphasis uh, on different issues, depending on your perspective or what your specialty is, at the end of the day, um, we're all in this together. And, uh, you know, that's really the theme that we've tried to to uh, to push, and that is, um, you know, the practice of medicine. If you really care about uh, the future, and you really want uh, physicians to to keep their their stature as as the captain of the ship, as you say, or the leader of the team, um, we've got to have membership. We've got to have people involved. Uh, you know, and not everybody has the time to give, uh, but certainly everybody can can be a member and and should be a member, and so. And hopefully they see that, uh, uh, you know, the organization is diverse, that we do have representation, uh, generational. You know, one of the things I, I, that's really interesting about the FMA is we have, um, we have obviously, you know, differences between specialties uh, that we have always, you know, had to deal with. But, you know, you have generational differences. You have differences between you know, physicians who might be independent practice or uh, versus uh, uh, physicians that are in an employed setting. So we, we have to balance all of those things. I think that makes the organization better and stronger to have, uh, you know, different voices. And uh, I can't think of an organization or a group of physicians now that's underrepresented at the FMA because I think everybody, um, you know, has a voice. And, uh, well, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, I think the FMA Leadership Academy really has helped with that. By the way, I'll just give a little plug to that because that's how I got really involved was through that. And then I started to see, just as you said, that gener generational shift starting to occur in a very obvious way, not just words on a paper or a number here or there, but no, it was extremely obvious. And for, so that was 2012 when I graduated from the academy. And so in eight years, it's changed. The, the dynamic of the FMA has changed quite a bit. Everyone to join so that they can see that um, because it really has changed significantly um, over the past 10 years or so. Let's just make it 10 years, round it up. There you go.
it's been really, really a beautiful journey and I've, I've loved being a part of it. And yeah. Well, it's just the beginning of your journey um, because uh, I, I, I have a feeling you're going to be involved with the FMA and organized medicine for a long time. So, you know, thank you for spending some time with us today. I know you're busy, um, but it's real important that that uh, that physicians hear from their colleagues about their journey, uh, why they're involved in organized medicine. And uh, I appreciate you sharing all of all of that with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. This is awesome. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Florida Medical Association, helping physicians practice medicine.